Good morning, everyone. Good morning. <laughs> I'm feeling grateful today that we can be here, come to church and be together. And um, it's a privilege, isn't it, to be able to worship God like this. My name's Yvonne, and I'd like you now to arise because we're going to sing, O oh, Church, Arise.
Please be seated. A reading from 1 Peter 2, 9 to 10. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a royal, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Let us pray. Would you pray this with me, please? Gracious God, we humbly thank you for life and health and safety, for freedom to work, leisure to rest, and for all that is beautiful in creation and human life. But above all, we praise you for our Saviour, Jesus Christ, for his death and resurrection, for the gift of your spirit, and for the hope of sharing in your glory. Fill our hearts with all joy and peace in believing through Jesus Christ, our Lord, Amen. Amen. <laughs> this morning, Tim is helping us to look at a path to forgiveness and redemption through the lens of David's prayer in Psalm 51. He will ask, can we even be restored? Over the last 20 years, Phil and I have run the Alpha Marriage Course many times. We love the material and we learn something every time we lead the course. But when we get to week four, I have a bit of a struggle. The chapter is called The Power of Forgiveness. The lead leaders on the video talk about anger and how many of us struggle to resolve conflict and show forgiveness to one another. We learn about two types of personalities in a relationship. Those who are like a rhino, <laughs> blast in, saying and doing destructive things in the heat of the moment, Apparently, Prince Ch oh, King Charles is one of those. Did you hear, read that in the paper this week when he threw his pen down? He's a rhino, they say. I think those t types of people need a lot of forgiveness. <laughs> the other type is like a hedgehog. They just curl up, stick out their prickly needles, 
say nothing and hope everything will blow over when the rhino calms down. That's me. What I've learned is that my behavior is just as destructive, that I need to be able to say sorry first so that I can seek forgiveness and can be restored. The International Children's Bible puts Psalm 51 like this. But Lord, you are a God who shows mercy and is kind. You don't become angry quickly. You have great love and faithfulness. So kids, this is your opportunity to come down and be with Lizzie. Yeah, kids, come on down. That was so lovely. I feel like we don't need a kid's talk. That was so lovely. And that was the cutest rhino I've ever seen. Come on down, make sure you can see. Just a few props today. Hello, good morning. I was excited to show you my heart today, uh, but I don't want to because it's not clean. Actually, my heart is very dirty. Sparkly, yes, but dirty. I don't know how it got that way. I tried cleaning it myself, but it just stayed dirty. Something I haven't tried is asking God for help. Dear God, please give me a clean heart. Let's see. That worked. This is my heart. You can clap. Yeah. <laughs> that was amazing. This is my heart. It was dirty, but it's been made clean. Today in church and Sunday club, we are looking at a prayer that King David prayed. David did something horrible. He did something terrible. He did something very wrong. When he realized how wrong it was, David prayed to God. He said, create in me a clean heart, O God. David knew that his sin had hurt people and hurt God. And he knew his sin meant he needed God's forgiveness. He needed to say sorry to God. Do you remember how dirty my heart was before? That's what sin is. It's like our hearts are dirty. Sin is the mean things we think and say, the bad things we do, the good things we don't do. Sin is when we turn away from God. But what do we do with a sinful heart? What do we do with our dirty heart? Only God can clean our heart. Only God can clean us and make our hearts clean. Because Jesus makes us clean. Jesus washes our sins away when we say sorry to him. When we turn to God, Jesus washes us clean. Let's thank God for that now. Let's pray together. Dear God, thank you for washing away our sins and making us clean and new. Thank you for loving and forgiving us. Help us to live your way today and every day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, thank you, Yvonne. We are the body of Christ. The peace of the Lord be always with you.
Please greet one another. Kids, you can go off to Kids Club. Our first reading comes from St. Mark's Gospel. I'm going to commence at verse 7, the beginning of the paragraph, to verse 15 of chapter 3. Jesus withdrew from his disciples to the lake and a large crowd from Galilee followed. When they heard about all he was doing, many people came to him from Judea, Jerusalem, Idumea, and the regions across the Jordan and around Tyre and Sidon. Because of the crowd, he told his disciples to have a small boat ready for him, to keep the people from crowding him. For he had healed many, so that those with diseases were pushing forward to touch him. Whenever the impure spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, you are the son of God. But he gave them strict orders not to tell others about him. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to him those he wanted, and they came to him. He appointed 12 that they, that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. This is the word of the Lord. Psalm 51 on page 457 of the Pew Bibles. Have mercy on me, O God, 
according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, and you who are God my Saviour. My tongue will sing of your righteousness. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart you, God, will not despise. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Norman. Thank you, Michael. Good morning. My name is Tim. Um, I'm a member of the faith community here at St. Mark's, and it's such a pleasure as we seek to love Jesus and make sense of life together that we can come together this Sunday morning. And may the words of my lips and the meditations of my heart be pleasing to the Lord. Recently, there seems to have been a spate of Christian leaders falling from grace, and even secular people have fallen in recent times. I won't name any names, but I'm sure that you could think of some if you thought about it. Some are so significant that in the last few weeks we've seen some documentaries come out about them. And I don't talk about this lightly. I know that many of you will have been positively impacted by some of those people who have fallen from grace, and you may have been deeply hurt by it. But it might not even have been someone famous. You may have been hurt by someone you know directly who led you to Jesus or a family member who is now no longer interested in Jesus or even worse, may have done something that you thought was completely out of line for someone who claimed to know Jesus. But it might not be an individual. Maybe it's an institution or a church that has hurt you. We know that the church in Australia has hurt people significantly. And when it happens, we mourn. And I think coming out of those experiences, we may have two questions. The first is, how do we handle sin? And the second is, is there a path to forgiveness and restoration? Is that even appropriate? And I think today's psalm helps us grapple with it. We've been doing a series on prayer, on Abraham, on Hannah, on Moses, on Jacob, and now we encounter a prayer from someone who has perhaps one of the biggest falls from grace in the Old Testament. 
Early on, before he becomes the king of Israel, King David is called a man after God's own heart. He trusts in God when no one else does. He writes prayers and praises to God like no one else does. We're singing songs that he wrote thousands of years later. We meet someone who trusts God so implicitly that he goes on the battlefield with no armor and only a slingshot, and he triumphs for a nation. Someone who so loves God, so who's so wrapped up in his adoration of God that he dances like no one is watching, even though many people are watching. We, he's, David is so important to the story of God's people that one of Jesus' titles is Son of David. For those who grew up in the church, we will have heard many stories about David, but we also know about his fall from grace. And even today, what he did raises significant questions for us. And the story that Psalm 51, the prayer Psalm 51 is written about, you can read about it in 2 Samuel 11 onwards. David was a God-given king of God's own people. God had given him perhaps everything a person could desire. He had tremendous gifts, but he was also a warrior. He was a king. He was rich. He was powerful. And the prophet Nathan says in 2 Samuel 12, if, and if what you had was not enough, you only had to ask for it and God would have given you more. But David desired more. I don't know how they're talking about this part in kids' church. It's quite a, quite a difficult story. Uh, David wanted Bathsheba. And so he took her. Because this is a family service, I'll be careful with my language. But the indication from the text is that this was a non-consensual encounter, that Bathsheba was unable to refuse the king of Israel. And then to cover it up, David has Bathsheba's husband murdered. And, David, and Bathsheba's husband wasn't just any soldier. It wouldn't have mattered if it was just any soldier. It's just as terrible then. But Bathsheba's husband was someone David knew. He was Uriah, a member of David's own bodyguard. He would have been personally connected to him. And this all seems very grim for Sunday morning, doesn't it? But it brings us to today's passage. David's prayer is from the very worst place he could be, realizing and becoming self-aware and being prompted by the Holy Spirit that he has committed grievous and terrible actions. And it leads us to the first question. How do we handle sin? What do we do when famous Christians fall from grace? How do we deal with it when people we love fall from grace? How do we deal with our own sin? We meet David asking God to have mercy on him, and David telling God that only against God has he sinned. And so we might think that David gets off lightly, that he has taken Bathsheba, that he has murdered Uriah, and that he still gets to be king. In fact, it seems like he doesn't even understand that he's done something wrong. He says, only against you, God, have I sinned. So how do we deal with this? When we stuff up, do we only need to deal privately with God in prayer? Do we only need to tell God that we sinned against you? Is this passage a justification for never confessing our sins publicly, for never having to do anything when we stuffed up, and just privately saying sorry to God? And so ultimately... We ask the same question people ask when someone falls from grace, when someone seems to get away with it. Is that it? Is that all David has to do? Is there no justice? What about Bathsheba? She was sinned against greatly. What about Uriah? He was sinned against greatly. What about the soldiers who were murdered along with Uriah to cover it up? They were sinned against greatly. We also see how David compounds his initial sin by trying to cover it up. And in covering it up, he causes even more people to be hurt. David's sin is so great that he sends a note that causes Uriah to be murdered with Uriah. He manipulates this man of integrity to carry his own death warrant with him. David has sinned against all of these people. And in sinning against the Lord, David has sinned against people. 
Jesus acknowledges that the two great commandments are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, might, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. But by sinning against Bashi, and he says that the second one is to love your neighbor as yourself. By sinning against Bathsheba, by sinning against Uriah, and many others, ultimately David has sinned against God. He has not loved his neighbor as himself. David, by harming Bathsheba, by destroying Uriah, and everyone else involved in his wicked plans, has deeply sinned against them. He has harmed those made in the image of God. He has hurt his family and his nation. And in so doing, he has sinned against God. We know from 1 Samuel 12 that David's sin has made God detestable in the eyes of Israel's enemies. God's people were meant to be different. God's people are meant to act like God's people. But David has acted like every other king in this time of the world. He has taken a woman as his own without her consent. He has had her husband murdered to cover it up. And he has let innocent people who serve him become killed or corrupted because of his own sin. And we see the exact same pattern in today's world and in the church's fall from grace. For many of you, I know that it will be hard to say in your workplaces, in your schools, and even to your families that you're a Christian and you go to church. Because our actions as a church have made God detestable to those he created. One of the reasons we're so committed to be safe for all people, and especially children at church, while we go through all those processes I know that many of you will find difficult and tedious, is that we are trying to recover trust. I am thankful that St. Mark's, that you are committed to getting this right. Because our sin against innocent, innocent image bearers is not just sin against them. It is a sin against God. By saying only against God he has sinned and done evil in what is God's sight, David is not trying to minimize his sin. David recognizes the seriousness of it. When we sin against others, when we harm them through what we have done and through what we have not done, we sin also against our God. We make him detestable. The plea against you, you only have I sinned, is not a minimization of David's sin, but a recognition that there is no minimization of sin. When we hurt those in relationship with us, we are hurting God's very image bearers, and so we sin against God. I said the first question the psalm raises, how do we handle sin? And the answer is that we acknowledge its seriousness. It's not just an innocent white lie. It's not just something that was done years ago. It's not her fault or his fault. It's not something that the church did years ago and can't we just get over it? Sin is serious. It has made God detestable. Our sin, our behavior as Christians, has turned people against God. Sin is a force that we are captured by, a darkness that would engulf the world. Serious theologians will note that the New Testament is not a drama between God and humans only, but is a three-part drama, God, evil, and humanity. That evil Satan has snared us in darkness and will continue to try and tempt us towards sin. This is the seriousness of sin. Do you feel it? Do you sense the seriousness of sinning against God? David has destroyed a marriage, taken a woman against her will, and murdered her husband and others to cover it up. Sin is serious. By every law of the Old Testament, David should have been put to death. And so now you might become cynical. Well, you might say, well, like we've seen today, this powerful king has just got away with it. He's still the king. Friends, David does not get away with it. We know that God will judge us. David knows this. He tells God that he is right in his verdict and justified when God judges. We know that we will face judgment. We have a wonderful series of windows behind me and on your right, my left, there's the 
he makes all things new, pointing to the second coming of Jesus. He will make all things new, but that will involve his judgment as well. And even in his lifetime, David suffered the consequences of his sin. David's kingship is much diminished by his sin, and his family is destroyed by his sin. The people of Israel would have known that God had judged David. Tamar, David's daughter, takes her own life after Amnon, David's son, does to his sister what he had seen his father do to Bathsheba. David's son, Absalom, will rebel against him. And who advises Absalom? A man named Ahitophel. And who was Ahitophel? Most likely he was Bathsheba's grandfather. You see how sin flows through and corrupts and hurts so many people. And these weren't God's judgments against David. This was the direct consequence of David's sin. In a sense, the consequence of David's sin ends up being part of the judgment, but it's caused by David's actions. Our sin has severe and serious consequences. The church is not trusted in many places because of our sins as a church. When we harm others we love through our sin, we lose their trust. Sin is so serious that it cascades through generations. I think we've addressed that first question enough, don't you? How do we handle sin? We treat it seriously, and we don't minimize it, and we don't brush it away. And so our second question then, is there a path to forgiveness and redemption? And this is a place from this very grim sermon so far. You're hoping the answer is yes, right? Our cynicism may surface again, though. We may ask, should there be a path to forgiveness and redemption? And this is a live question for many people in today's world. Because it is a question for all of us. Is there forgiveness for people we know who have done things we see as terribly wrong? Is there forgiveness and restoration for us when we do terrible things? Sorry, I'm struggling to grab the right page. There we go. Is there forgiveness? And I say, yes, praise God, there is. And this is an astonishing scandal. And I think scandal is the right word at the heart of Christianity. Because if you look at David and say that God can forgive him for what he has done, that that is a scandal that God forgives him, isn't it? And we may so swim in the sea of Christianity that we forget how remarkable it is that someone like David, having done everything David has done, can be forgiven by God. David has done much worse than some of those Christian leaders you're thinking about. He still comes before God and asks for God to deliver him from the guilt of bloodshed. He still says God is his savior. And this is how we know that there's a path to forgiveness and redemption. We see it in David's prayer here. It starts with ourselves acknowledging that God can forgive. Because David isn't forgiven because of who David is. David isn't forgiven because he's a man after God's own heart. That was said about David when he was a young man, before comfort and privilege and power led to him stepping very far from God. David's not forgiven because he was a good and powerful king. He is not forgiven because he wrote beautiful praise music. David is forgiven because of who God is. And even David's restoration, we read in verse 10, Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. David is forgiven and restored not because of who he is, but because of who God is. We are not forgiven because of how good we are, but because of how humble Jesus is. We are not made right with God because we act perfectly or because we can make ourselves right, but because our righteous Savior Jesus lived, died, and rose and is interceding with us before God. David is forgiven because he acknowledges that he has done the wrong thing and genuinely repents. David is forgiven because God forgives him. David is forgiven because we looked at a couple of weeks ago when we, because as we looked at a couple of weeks ago when we spoke about Moses, God is compassionate and gracious, 
maintaining his mercy to thousands and to hundreds of thousands and to millions and to billions. David acknowledges that he has done wrong. He has committed bloodshed, as he says in verse 14, and he has a broken and a contrite heart. David knows that he has sinned. And so when we ask, is there a path to forgiveness and restoration, we say, yes, yes, there is a path. God renews in us a new spirit. Jesus has made it so that we can be forgiven and restored. But I think that doesn't mean that we shouldn't say that restoration is necessarily straightforward or easy. We can see, not from Psalm 51, but from Samuel and onwards, that David's life is very difficult because of his sin, even after there's restoration. At a church I used to go to, there was a man who went to jail for white-collar crime, which is a bit shocking, but he did. And this happened only because he pleaded guilty. He will share that his lawyer had said to him, there is not enough evidence. All you have to say to the judge is that you are not guilty and you will go free. This man had a young family, was married, and his lawyer had told him all he had to do to avoid jail was to say that he was not guilty. But he was convicted before going up before the judge that in fact he was guilty, that he had done the wrong thing. And so he shocked his lawyer and the judge and by admitting his guilt. Friends, that man understood where forgiveness, redemption, and restoration start. He went to jail. For him, the path to redemption started with acknowledging that he had done the wrong thing. But we see that restoration can be really difficult, can't it? So just saying sorry might not be enough. As Christians, we're sometimes in danger of suggesting that forgiveness is so wonderful and so great, and it is. But we sometimes jump straight from there to restoration of someone to what they originally were, to the real relationship they were in, to positions of authority. But this isn't biblical or wise. It might be right that someone who is restored is not restored to exactly where they were before. So just saying sorry might not be enough. And so if you have been abused or mistreated, if you have been ill-used by an individual or by a church, and if that person did not stop what they were doing and said sorry, and if they did not face in some very difficult cases consequences, and if they have tried and covered it up, they may not be truly sorry. Sin is serious, and restoration should also be serious. A few weeks ago, I introduced you to one of my faith heroes, Bishop Festo Kivanjeri from Uganda, who actually has a lot to say about this particular issue, but I won't talk about him today. I want to introduce you to another of my faith heroes, Sarah Grimke. Sarah and her sister Angelina were born to a family in the south. In the, they would have been born in the 18th century, but did most of their work in the 19th century. They were born to a family that had slaves. And they went on to become some of the leading abolitionists in the United States. And I want to mention briefly that I'm not talking about them to present a narrative of white saviorship. There are many African Americans like Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman and Sojourner Truth who did magnificent work for their people. But I want to tell you about Sarah, because Sarah came from the oppressors. Her family owned slaves. But Sarah recognized this great wrong. But she didn't stop there with a the recognition of the wrong. She became a leading advocate for abolition, even agitating against the denominational boundaries to become a leading speaker, writer, and thinker on this issue. On a personal level, she learned that her brother had had children with one of his slaves, and she made sure that those children received an education. Sarah understood that what her family had done, what her class had done, and what her faith community had done in approving of slavery and owning slaves was wrong. But repentance and restoration meant not just saying that she was sorry, but it may, meant engaging with the work of fighting against that which was wrong. And she did that. So we see that sin is serious. And to deal with it properly requires serious work. It requires repenting. It requires the hard work of coming on our knees before God and saying against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. And acknowledging that God is right to judge us. 
And then we rejoice because God is great, because he is compassionate to a thousand generations, maintaining mercy through Jesus Christ. So let me be pastoral for a moment as we come towards the end. It is my job, after all. Many of you will have a tender conscience and a soft heart, and you may then feel that you do not de deserve forgiveness, that God maybe could forgive other people, but not you. Friends, in Christ Jesus, you are forgiven. Friends, Jesus has room for you. God forgave David. On the cross, Jesus saved the criminal next to him, a criminal who confessed that he deserved crucifixion. You can be forgiven. And if we're forgiven, we need to live forgiven. It may be painful facing the consequences of true repentance. It may mean loss of position and of face. But the truth of the love of God is this, that when you come before Jesus, when he causes you to truly repent, you will experience his love and support. One of the lies the evil one will tell us is that if we confess what we have done, that people will reject and hate us. Let me tell you that when we confess what we have done, people will support us and love us. There will be people who you will be surprised by who will support you and love you because in Christ Jesus we are community and when people seek forgiveness and restoration, we need to help them with that. Even as they may face the consequences of what they have done. David calls on God to create in him a pure heart and to renew a steadfast spirit within him. Right after I finish, which is very soon, we're going to sing together, Create in Me a Clean Heart. It's a bit of an old song, but it's based on Psalm 51. And it's an opportunity for us to reflect that God creates in us a clean heart and a pure heart. And so part of this means that if we're sinning and if we're truly repenting, we will need to stop doing it. And so we may need help. If we have an addiction or an habituated behavior that is sinful, we may, th we may need therapy. And that is a way the Holy Spirit works in today's world. So yes, we handle sin the first question was, how do we handle sin? We handle it by treating it seriously and by pointing to the cross and that Jesus saves, not because of our greatness, but because of God's power and compassion and mercy. And then the second question, is there a path to restoration and forgiveness? Yes, friends, there is. That is the scandal of the cross. Amen. Let me pray. Father, create in us a pure heart and renew our steadfast spirit within us, not just as individuals, but as a church. Lord God, we ask this through the powerful and redemptive name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please stand.
Let us pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you, Lord God. You make us strong. You are our mighty rock, our fortress, our protector, the rock where we are safe. We marvel, Father, that we can come into your presence and talk with you and listen to your voice. Thank you, Father, for this opportunity to come to you as church and share with you the things on our hearts and minds. We thank you, Father, for the myriad of gifts you shower on us every day. Sunshine, rain, clean air, friendships, family, food, shelter, and the knowledge of your great love for us. Thank you. We bring before you those around this world who live in conflict, in war zones, in hunger, famine, in disease-ravished lands, in corruption, in spiritual darkness. And we yearn for you, Father God, to bring your peace, your hope, your love to individuals and to nations. May your name and the name of Jesus be lifted high and your name be praised. We ask you, Father, continue and hope to those at the retreat. We thank you too, Father, that you are with Bet, uh, Matt and Beck uh, Ui in Japan. We ask you to lead them to a rental property that's suitable for their needs. And we ask that you would help them all as they embark on language learning. May they know your presence and your peace. Father, in Australia, <clears throat> there are many political and social areas of concern. You know, Father, the issues that concern each of us. We ask your Holy Spirit to guide our leaders, both secular and sacred, to lead and guide them. We ask also that your Holy Spirit might so indwell each of us that we will know what it is you want us to do, how you want us to act, what you want us to say, how you want us to pray. In our own church, Father, we thank you that you are at work in our search for a new vicar. We thank you for being with the incumbency committee. We ask you to continue to lead them Give them your wisdom and encouragement and keep us faithful in praying for them. We lift into your presence today, dear Father, your beloved daughters, Helen Potts and Ruth Judd, who have special needs at this time. We thank you for these, the great faith of these two women and we ask you to comfort them, uphold them, and bless them with your presence and peace today and throughout this week. And we pray for your peace and comfort for the family and friends of Nan Cook as we grieve her passing, even though we also rejoice at her being with you. And we pray for others known to us personally who are in need of a special touch from you 
We name them silently before you now. We ask you, Father, to bless each one with your love and peace. Thank you that you are a God who loves to give good gifts to those who ask in faith. We trust these ones who are close to our hearts in your care. And Lord God, we give thanks for all those who've made this service such a blessing today, a blessing for those of us in this church building and a blessing for those who are listening in their homes. Please, Father, encourage each one who has played a part in enabling us to worship this morning, no matter how large or small that contribution has been. And Father, we also ask you to guide us all in our conversations this week. Please give us opportunities to speak of your love and your truth to others and help us to rejoice in you always. And now, church, let us join together in praying the prayer the Lord Jesus taught his disciples and has taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And deliver us from evil, for the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Thank you, Gwen. Uh, as a faith community, we have some things that we do together. We have the Alpha course coming up in July. So if you have friends or family, or maybe for yourself, if you think about what it means to follow a God who forgives us, who through Jesus Christ is redemptive and has great mercy, Alpha is a great time to talk about that with them and come along with them. So I'd encourage you to be praying about who you might invite. This Tuesday lunch, we have the WOW lunch. I was like, that's the women of worth is WOW. Um, I don't go to them. But I'm in the office when they happen, and I can see that they have wonderful food, wonderful fellowship. So you're very welcome to come this Tuesday. Kate will be speaking, and you can talk to Yvonne, who you'll see in a moment, about going. We have the parish camp coming up in August. We have brochures at the back, which has a link to register online. We would love to have you come. We have different ways you can stay with us. And if, you're, if cost is an issue for you, we don't want that to stop you from coming. Please talk to me or Stephen and we can make sure that you can still come. We would love to have your fellowship with us. Next week, Wei Han will be here. If you were expecting him today, my apologies, but he will be here next week. Um, we have CMS missionaries that we partner with so that people can hear the good news with John and Deb and Matt and Bex, who Gwen prayed for. Uh, and Wei Han will be speaking to us about how our partnership is helping people hear the good news of Jesus. And we're going to have our closing song now, Tell Out My Soul. This will also be our offertory song. Please stand.
pray for our offering. Thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. Thank you for the opportunity to give to mission, maintenance, and ministry at St. Mark's and beyond. Amen. Thank you, Nan. Um, as Gwen mentioned, we thank those of, um, who've contributed to the service today. We really appreciate your contribution, and thank you, Tim, for helping us work through such a difficult topic. <laughs> You're making me all emotional now because I'm not sure if I've ever heard a sermon that's really dealt with that so powerfully, so thank you. After the service, there'll be prayer in the vestry and I'd love it if you would come and join me for morning tea with Jodine and James. Let's finish with our prayer. Um, it's not that prayer, we're sing saying the prayer, may the God of peace, that's it. May the God of peace equip you with everything good for doing his will, working in you what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory for ever and ever. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.